I'm pretty sure that this workshop is going to be a fantastic experience for everyone. We've brought in diverse perspective on uh, what is going on with communication about risk communication about uh, extreme tropical cyclones. My name is Ann Bostrom. I'm from the University of Washington Evans School of Public Policy and Governance. And uh, I would love to be able to introduce the committee members to you in a second here. I think we have a slide for this, is this correct? And in the meanwhile, I'll start with my other messages. So welcome everybody. Uh, we have a wonderful workshop planned to really lively half days of uh, exciting events, including breakouts and including panels with very diverse perspectives, a broad array of perspectives on tropical cyclones. We have an extremely busy schedule, so we're going to try to keep on schedule and be ruthless with time keeping, and that goes for everybody, so please remember your time limits. And now are we ready for the slides? Excellent. So I, I'm going to introduce the statement of tax task and the committee. The, you can see here the members of the committee. Whoops. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, my, I'm chairing. Derek Carroll Smith uh, participated very actively in the in the committee and is unfortunately unable to be with us today. Brad Coleman is sitting here. Uh, William Ful uh, Craig Fugate, Mike Lindell, who is also unable to be with here today, but will be online. And Andrea Schumacher from the National Center for Atmospheric Research, Marshall Shepard, and Jeanette Sutton all names that are probably familiar to all of you. The people who really made this committee work are listed on the right side, the National Academy staff, Hugh Walpole, who has been study director and been fantastic to work with, John Bensuelo, who brought, whose name I can't pronounce, and, and who brought the experience of a, a longer time at the Academy, Rachel Silvern, who I've had the great pleasure of working with before as well, Rachel Sanchez, who helped us uh, uh, quite extensively in the beginning parts of this committee and is no longer here. Rita Gaskins, Rob Greenway, and Eric Edkin. We thank you all for your support for this committee. It's been wonderful to work with you and we're looking forward to see how, how the proceedings turns out. So with that, I'd like to introduce the statement of task for the committee. Perhaps. Aha. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, I don't have it memorized. <laughs> Does anybody else have it memorized? <laughs> to... Ah, okay. It's a hidden slide. Well, the task was not hidden to us, so um, I can see it here on the left. Excellent. So this was an ad hoc committee. This is just to get you all to relax. If you don't have a few technical difficulties, you can't relax. So we can look at it this way. So, ah, perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. So this committee planned this workshop to explore challenges and learning opportunities around actionable and understandable risk communication with decision makers for extreme weather events. There's a lot of details here. I'm going to skip the details, but we have three main topics. First, exploring the current understanding of effective communication practices and features to convey to decision makers uncertainty and probabilistic information about risks associated with discrete extant extreme weather events, such as that that we are experiencing in California right now with unprecedented high winds, which makes this workshop extremely timely and emphasizes the importance of learning more about this as we go forward. We were also tasked to examine risk communication and decision-making challenges posed by extreme weather events that are unprecedented in nature or scale for the affected locations. And finally, to explore opportunities for learning from synergies, successes, and challenges across multiple hazards and decision-making contexts and applying them to the hurricane context. And the breakouts this afternoon will especially explore this. So we're really looking forward to learning a lot, all of us who have been working in this domain for a while from other domains as well as from each other. And with that, I'm going to pass it to Andrea Schumacher so we will be able to stay on time. Thank you. Um, I don't think so. Try pressing the button. Ah, perfect. <laughs> the red light is always the good good thing to see. Um, so I'm Andrea Schumacher, and I have the pleasure of introducing our first panel today. Um, so the first session we are going to be uh, having today, starting things off, uh, is communicating risks of atypical tropical cyclones, lessons from Henri and Hillary. 
Um, there are many, many other tropical cyclones we could have included in this list, and we don't want to. Um, we want to encourage our panel members to to speak on anything that they choose. <laughs> Those are just two recent examples. The goal of this session is to gain an understanding of the unique challenges, opportunities for innovation, and lessons learned in communicating evolving tropical cyclone threats. Um, and our panel members joining us today from the Weather Prediction Center, Center we have Alex Lamers. And from the um, WFO, which is the Weather Forecast Office in Los Angeles, Oxnard, we have Rose Schoenfeld. And I believe we have Robbie Berg on the line. See, I'm here. Uh, from the National Hurricane Center. He is a hurricane specialist who also uh, works with their social science outreach. So, um, I would actually like the panelists now to each introduce themselves with just a couple of minutes and give us an idea of what their perspectives are and their experience that they'll be bringing to this discussion. So start with Alex, if that's okay. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. I'm really glad to be here. So my name is Alex Lamers. I am the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the Weather Prediction Center. Um, and we're one of, you know, about 10 national centers in uh, the National Weather Service. and each national center is sort of focused on a particular forecast challenge. Uh, so for the National Hurricane Center, the challenge is pretty obvious. For the Weather Prediction Center, it sounds a little bit more generic, but we're really focused on temperature and precipitation extremes. And um, those can both come into play uh, before and after hurricanes. Um, but really, the thing you think most of is the extreme rainfall. So um, my role is really to coordinate with our partners uh, and that's internal to the weather service and external um, and work really, really closely with the National Hurricane Center on the rainfall aspects of tropical cyclones. Uh, and that partnership has grown in leaps and bounds in the last five to 10 years. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Rose Schoenfeld, and I work at the WFO in Oxnard, California, and we cover uh, the Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles County, um, which is currently seeing quite the weather right now, as well as supported by the the Weather Prediction Center. Uh, we're focused on everything in our our specific area, and uh, one of the most notable weather events that we have had was uh, Hurricane Hillary, and that's really only being topped right now by this atmospheric river that we're seeing uh, currently. Um, I'm really excited to be here and uh, to talk about um, how that um, event was significant and uh, how it how it raised so many alarms because of how how uh, how scary the the thought of a hurricane hitting Los Angeles was. Robbie, hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there uh, with you today, uh, but I'm really honored to to be a part of this panel. Um, so. As Alex was mentioning, uh, as the National Hurricane Center, we're one of the 10 uh, centers within the National Weather Service that looks at kind of the large scale weather. Um, um, and we have a responsibility for looking at all tropical cyclones across the North Atlantic basin, as Robbie. well as- Okay, uh, we're good now. Thank you. Could you start over, Robbie? Sorry, right. we had a little difficulties. <laughs> sure, no problem. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this, my name is Robbie Berg. I'm a senior hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center. Uh, to say I'm sorry I couldn't be with everybody uh, there this morning, uh, but I'm still honored to be a part of this panel. Um, as Alex was mentioning, uh, the Hurricane Center is one of 10 national centers uh, where our goal is to essentially be monitoring and forecasting and communicating uh, tropical cyclones that occur within the North Atlantic and the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. So uh, while this panel is specifically talking about atypical tropical cyclones, uh, because we have such a large area, we see a lot of atypical tropical cyclones, uh, not just Henri and Hillary, as we're going to be discussing. Um, I work in a unit where we have, when we're fully staffed, 11 hurricane specialists, uh, and it's our job collectively uh, to make the forecast for the hurricanes, tropical storms, other tropical cyclones, coordinate, working with folks like Alex at the Weather Prediction Center and Rose at the uh, local WFOs, um, and then also provide briefings and other communications to emergency managers uh, and the media who are also communicating the message of tropical cyclones. Um, so we're in some sense, uh, you know, we're kind of the starting point of the forecast and how things get communicated down the road. So our, our interactions and, and, and relationships with all of our partners are extremely important uh, in these events. Great, thanks everyone. 
Um, so I'll sort of kick things off. Uh, we have some prepared questions that we'd love to get uh, answers from our panel on, um, and then we will open it up to questions from the in the audience and on online. So um, let's kick things off, and I, I'm happy to take whoever wants to jump in, or I can pick someone. Um, so what challenges and or barriers have you encountered in communicating the risks expected with relatively rare tropical cyclone events, particularly in the, the arena of communicating those risks? Um, I know there's a lot of language associated with hurricanes and tropical cyclones um, that is common to other types of events that I'm sure you've worked, so. I, uh, I can start with that. Um, for, for our region in Los Angeles, where we, we rarely see such an event, um, something that is a challenge is a lot of the words for hurricanes aren't really going to apply to us. Um, we we try to, to focus it um, and, and change our message to compare it to weather events we do see, like, like an atmospheric river, like Santa Ana winds. Um, we, we called it a wet Santa Ana a lot because a lot of that concept of, of tropical uh, messaging doesn't really apply for us. We're not really thinking about storm surge. We're not really thinking about um, a lot of the impacts that that will um, be greater for flatter terrain and, and places like that. Um, one thing I think just generally speaking about uh, extreme and rare tropical cyclones is that when you get into the tails, um, it, sometimes it's hard to uh, know how the meteorology will map onto impacts and how it will translate to impacts, right? Because you may be seeing something that you haven't necessarily seen before. Um, and so that can be a bit of a challenge for us in saying, you know, for instance, Hurricane Hillary is an example. We're getting all this rain. Um, you know, Death Valley could potentially get more rain than they see in a year and this sort of thing. And it's like, well, I don't quite know exactly how that's going to manifest into impacts in these areas. Um, we, we know it can, it probably will be bad. Um, but, um, the question is how bad, um, and so, so that can be a challenge. And, um, likewise, I think another challenge is just the constant drumbeat of extreme events that we have now and the pace that's increasing, uh, with climate change and, um, you know, uh, getting people to, to register each one of those and it just doesn't um, blur into one, um, uh, one thing and sort of lose its impact over time. So, so those are two just general observations I would say about communicating extreme events. Yeah. And, and I would add, uh, to all of that too, is noise. Um, you know, we we have a pretty tried and true process. Uh, with the hurricane center with all tropical cyclones that we forecast um and then the communication with emergency managers and other partners um and the message that we're putting out often gets conflicted with other noise that's out there whether it be on social media uh whether it be on traditional media um, some examples of that include things like over focusing on landfall um, in a lot of these systems landfall does not matter and oftentimes in, in the headlines you see uh, the scroll on the bottom of the news, it's, it's, it's focusing on these, what I call G whiz, G whiz characteristics of the storm. Uh, it's the first storm to do this. It's the first storm to do that. The landfall is expected to be here. Um, and that kind of uh, attention or hyper-focus on those type of characteristics really detracts from the message that we're trying to put out about what each of the hazards of a tropical cyclone may do, the risk that each of those poses. Um, so I think for us, it's just trying to wade through that noise and have the message, the most important message, get through to those who need it. And if I can add on to what Robbie just said, actually, um, you know, I think the gee whiz statistics, one thing I like to say is uh, I think there's a lot of focus in the lead up to a storm as it's approaching land on what I call the storm's vital signs. You know, the hurricane centers are hurricane hunters are almost like uh, doctors. They're taking the central pressure and the max wind and all this. And there's these, this hard data that I think people latch on to, which for good reason, um, of course. And that's what I think, because you're getting a regular tempo of new data in that respect, um, it can lead to a focus on those things. But of course we know in the last decade, actually, uh, statistics compiled by the hurricane center, actually rainfall induced flooding is the deadliest hazard in the United States. Um, and so getting people to focus on that uh, when the average person, even in the driest parts of the United States, will see thousands of rainy days in their lifetime, um, getting them 
you know, to to register that this is going to be a meaningful uh, rainy day rather than just one of many that they've seen, um, that that is a real challenge to break through. Really good point there. Um, for Los Angeles, we definitely get a, an absolute media frenzy whenever anything happens. Um, and, and we get a lot of like really leading questions that uh, frankly, us at the WFO aren't really the people to speak on it. We're not really the ones to make that call whether this is going to be more common with climate change. That's not really something you can determine with one single event that we're focused in on. Um, but that's that's really the thing that can get really distracting a lot, um, opposed to what we're trying to tell people is during this event, it's really important to try not to drive, which sometimes is is the the main message that we have opposed to um, something that's longer scale. Um, and yeah, that point of what, what rainy days are really important because rain can be really notable, um, for LA whenever it happens, but it doesn't always mean that, that we are asking people to make changes to their lives. Thank you. These are really great, great responses. Um, wanted to sort of dig a little bit deeper since you all have roles that are, um, working with emergency managers and other types of decision makers, um, in your CWAs or, or your, your constituencies. Um, how have decision makers reacted to warnings for rare tropical cyclone events you've worked through? Um, and what was expected or unexpected about decision maker responses in these events? I can start if everyone's okay, I guess. So, you know, I, I'll start by saying that um, at least along the East Coast of the United States and the Gulf, uh, we try to foster really strong relationships with emergency managers um, in coastal communities and inland as well. Um, every year we host through FEMA uh, workshops at the Hurricane Center. Uh, we also go out in the field and provide uh, workshops and seminars to emergency managers. And we know that having those relationships beforehand helps when the time comes to make a very heady decision before a, a tropical cyclone. Um, so in, in some sense, I think I'll, I'll take Henri, for example, in the Northeast, um, even though they don't get hit by tropical cyclones all that frequently, because we already have a network and, and, a, and a process there by the way we work with the emergency managers and we educate the emergency managers, um, they still, as far as it looks to us, have made appropriate actions ahead of Henri. Now, on the other side with Southern California and Hillary, and maybe Rose can speak more on this specifically, our relationship with those folks isn't as strong. We don't see tropical cyclones hitting Southern California that frequently. Um, so we don't have that pre-established relationship with many of those emergency managers uh, on tropical cyclones themselves. So I think that's one of the, one of the things that comes into play is uh, what kind of relationships do we, do we already have in place? And I, I'm very sure WFO Los Angeles has those relationships uh, with the EMs there. Uh, but from a national standpoint, the Hurricane Center's relationship with those emergency managers isn't as strong as it may need to be in the future. For uh, for Southern California, we have really strong existing relationships with our partners, and and we'd at least like to hope that 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 relationship for a more routine things like atmospheric rivers, Santa Ana winds, other hazards, fire weather will carry over towards um, more more unprecedented, newer, uh, more rare events like like hurricanes um, or, or tropical tropical storms. Uh, during this event, uh, our, our emergency managers in our region took it very seriously. Uh, they activated EOCs for all of the counties. Uh, we had people deployed to them to help them make those decisions. Um, and, and largely they acted well and, and by the end of the event, um, the, the general consensus amongst our emergency managers was, what is, was that it was generally a success, that people weren't driving as much, that there wasn't um, too many too many swift water res rescues due to getting people out of those areas um, and, and warning ahead of time. And there wasn't too many uh, roadway uh, flooding issues in terms of, of cars actually uh, running into hazards. So at the end of the day, we, we feel pretty fortunate in terms of how the impacts worked out for for life um for hurricane hillary uh, there, there was definitely property damage but um some of that is a little harder to mitigate um since it since it's the roadways are there the mudslide is is not really a, a stoppable um as protecting life 
Yeah, I think actually, was there zero fatalities in Hillary? Or it was. I think so. Yeah, um, I mean, I I don't know of any. There there might be some, but. Yeah, I I thought it was zero, or it's very close to it, which is pretty amazing, right? You have a really unusual <laughs> event um the, just the uh not only a tropical cyclone but the amount of rain that it delivered especially to inland areas and you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of damage to some of these inland counties um and it, it was either their costliest well, uh, hazardous event on record or one of the costliest and you're talking about a significant percentage of their county gdp or, or close to it so to get zero fatalities out of that is pretty impressive so clearly there's some connection there that's going right at the local office um, you know, some one of the surprising things that I've noticed more recently is um, evacuating people out of harm's way for the rainfall aspects of these storms, not necessarily whole scale evacuations of a major metro area like that would be a huge undertaking. Uh, Robbie can speak more on that with how they do that for the storm surge, but um, at least in a targeted way towards vulnerable populations. So after, you know, the back to back of Henri and Ida in the same, basically in a few week period in New York City, they had a new flash flood action plan. It built in targeted actions like evacuating people who live in basement apartments uh, and ways to get to those people and get to them in advance. Um, in Hurricane Hillary, we saw them evacuating some homeless populations out of vulnerable areas in advance, hundreds of people. Uh, and I think that's pretty interesting. It means that there's a confidence in these decision makers and the rainfall forecast that we're providing and the information that we're providing um, and that they can take action. And so I think understanding a little bit more of you know, how they're making these decisions, sort of the clearance times that they would need um, to evacuate these vulnerable populations would really help inform us as we try to improve these forecasts uh, over time. Yeah, to add what Alex is saying, you know, one thing that we, we really have to keep in mind too is, is exposure. Um, you know, looking back at some of the storm surge events from, from tropical cyclones, you have a, a cyclone like Ian that hit Southwest Florida a couple of years ago. And Obviously, Florida is you know, well used to tropical cyclones, yet we had a lot of deaths from storm surge. And I think it points to the fact that even though it, a region might be familiar with, this, with tropical cyclones, hurricanes, that doesn't mean a locality is familiar with tropical cyclones and hurricanes. Fort Myers Beach had not been hit by a storm like Ian uh, for years. They did have Charlie in 2003, but Charlie was very different characteristic-wise. Uh, and so... You know, a lot of deaths there. But then you take a storm like Idalia last year. Again, also hit west coast of Florida up near uh, Appalachian Bay. Um, no storm surge deaths at all there. Um, so it might be quick to say, oh, well, the, the storm surge warning program that we have, it's working. Uh, but it's, it's, it's hard to say that over a year, you know, we have a change. I think it's because of exposure and the populations in those areas and what uh, they're used to, what they're, knowing whether or not they're at risk of the storms and taking appropriate action. So um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because every storm is different and you have to take into their, the storm's characteristics and then where that storm is actually threatening. Um, and I think that's one of the aspects of Henri and Hillary is you've got two areas where the frequency of storms is not high. And so we know that the localities are not going to see those types of situations in hurricanes that frequently. Great. Thank you so much. I, I think it's a really nice theme that we can think about these next two days also is experience um, and how that varies, not just with people, but with time uh, as people come into contact with some of these new hazards. Um, so now we want to turn it to uh, asking some questions specifically about these events. And have you used any novel or innovative approaches um, while you were communicating these rare events? Um, and, and how successful do you feel they were Uh, for, for our office, something we did that, um, I don't know, Robbie might have remembered is our ARA MIC, our meteorologist in charge, really pushed to get um, the timeline for products issuance accelerated. So normally there's there's a standard window that tropical storm watches are issued, tropical storm warnings are issued. But since Southern California has um, never seen that product issued before, um, ever, uh, we really pushed to issue that earlier, and, and we did issue that. Um, 
the tropical storm watch and warning ahead of what the normal hurricane center schedule would be to try and um, give people some more time to um, process those new products. Um, that also, um, those products might have even been in some ways, it, it could have been somewhat of a distraction from the message. Uh, maybe going forward, it won't be anymore. But with that first one, that novelty of it um, definitely um, could have distracted people from the main message being this is more rain than usual for August by a long shot. This is um, th that that's the main thing to prepare for uh, besides like whether or not it's the first warning or not. Um, you know, I think it, one thing that really resonated with me with what Robbie was saying earlier is um, the importance of laying track with partners before the events um, and uh, making those connections. And um, part of that is, you know, establishing the relationship, but part of it is understanding the products and that sort of thing. And so uh, one, one thing that we do with rainfall is we use the excessive rainfall outlook here at WPC to communicate the threat. It's for people who don't want to get into the details, it's a simple tiered outlook. It's kind of stoplight pattern, and people can sort of intuitively understand that the high end of the scale, the reds and the magentas are bad. Um, and but but um, to use a slightly different storm as an example, Harvey in 2017, um, the policy was we could only issue the highest category of risk uh, up to two days in advance, day one and day two. Um, but our forecasters were looking at, at that. They were sitting on the operations floor, just the model forecasts of an astronomical amount of rain. And they were saying, look, if we're ever going to issue a high risk uh, three days in advance, this is when we should do it. Like, this is the event. And they were so confident that by the product definition, that probability, uh, there, that probability did exist of that extreme of an event that um, they coordinated a change in real time to weather service policy. It happened in about 10 minutes. It was coordination from the local office to WPC, to the hurricane center, to weather service headquarters. And our Sue just on the fly made a change to the coding to allow that to happen. Um, and I think that's a, a really cool example of the way that, you know, when we feel that an event is potentially really, really impactful, um, you can, you can get everybody on board really quickly and, and singing the same tune and, um, consistency of message, I think is really important in helping it sink in. So we knew the local office was going to really want to hit that hard. And this gave them another tool to do that, um, saying, Hey, this is something that the weather service has never done before with this particular product. Um, and hopefully it made a bit of a difference. Yeah. So real quick, I'll say, uh, uh, Kind of piggybacking on what Rose said uh, with, with Hillary, we did issue the watches and warnings in Southern California a little bit earlier than what the typical lead time is. Uh, it's 48 hours for chalk select for watches, excuse me, and 36 hours for warnings. Um, and that's not abnormal uh, with other events we've seen. In fact, lots of times for some of the more major hurricanes, um, one of the issues we have is when, when storm surge and hurricane warnings go out, it also sends out WIA alert messages to folks. And we know that sometimes if those warnings get issued, say, at 11 p.m. or 4 or 5 a.m., uh, there's a little bit of uh, consternation among the public when they're getting woken up to by these alerts. So we've actually worked with the local WFOs to uh, slide some of the issuances of those warnings to a, a more appropriate time to communicate them uh, so that people are already awake. Uh, it's not going to bother them at times overnight. Um, so we do have a little bit of that flexibility, even though there is a specific policy times, uh, you know, with those watches and warnings. Uh, the other thing I was going to mention as far as of novel approaches, I would say for these two storms specifically, from the National Hurricanes perspective, again, where we're looking at large scale, what we did during these storms is not too different from what we do with any chalk cycle that threats, threatens the United States. We have policies and procedures that uh, we use every time there's a threatening storm. We increase and grow the message. Uh, messaging as we get closer to the event. Uh, two things that we've done uh, recently in the past few years is one, we've introduced key messages. And I know this has been starting across the weather service now. Um, and I think it's great because it's really setting the agenda and setting the message for folks in the media, emergency managers to carry that message forward with their constituents and who they're speaking to. Um, and then also we've done a lot more uh, live streaming on Facebook, on our YouTube channel, and we've found that uh, even some media folks are tuning in to those live streams that we do to take what's the most important message at that time 
and they're re-communicating that message uh, to the people that they're serving. So uh, again, it's not specific to these two events, uh, but I think it also proved to be beneficial in these events by us being out there providing these kind of chunk messages that are easy for people to digest and re-communicate during an event. Thanks so much. Um, this last uh, question I had for the panel, um, maybe a little touchy, <laughs> I'm sorry. So feel free not to, you know, you don't have to dig in too much, but um, I wanted to know if there was anything that you wanted to share with us that you would have done differently during these events, um, these recent events. And, you know, that can include Henri and Hillary, but also, you know, we've had Ida, which was a really uh, large rain event in, in the Northeast. So I'm um, just curious if there, I guess this is where we would love some lessons learned if you have some. Um, I can go first. Uh, so I think just generally speaking in the weather service uh, at any office, we try to learn from every event, uh, regardless of how well or bad it went. And um, and you talk to your partners. We've gotten, I think, better at doing that in the last decade. And they'll give you comments. They're going to give you honest feedback and say, well, could you do that? Or could you do this? I really like that, but could you do it a different way? And so trying to learn from that and, you know, Henri and Ida, the back to back in New York City was sort of, um, uh, I don't know that it was like really a, well, it was a bit of a lesson learned is just how important the rain rates are in urban areas. I mean, that's the specific act aspect of vulnerability and exposure like Robbie was talking about. Um, and so having a way to allow these large cities where you have huge amount of paved surface and people concentrated in one area, um, our director liked to call likes to call it the pavement and pipes problem. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're working, we have a project, we're working on developing an urban rain rate dashboard that will give uh, decision makers in large cities a chance to see when these chances of, of extreme rain rates are spiking up in their metro areas. So that's not a finished product yet, but we're sort of taking feedback from that type of storm saying, okay, we understand that there's a fundamental issue here that people want more information on and then trying to develop a solution. So that, that'd be one example. Uh, something that we've learned from this storm would be to um, just, just trying to learn how to communicate and better communicate that uncertainty with the tropical system. Um, that's always, always a challenge, um, but it definitely, like our feedback, at least from less so a lot of our partners, um, because they were working um, and seeing more impacts like across the, the region, but from the general public, um, a lot of the feeling that we've gotten is that um, people feel that Hurricane Hillary was overhyped, that it was, that it was nothing, like, oh, it was just rain. Um, oh, there wasn't really anything. I didn't feel any wind where I was. Um, so something that would be helpful going forward would be to um, try and once we have a better idea of what the the track is doing because when the track is a little more uncertain when that um, the because um, this this storm uh, made greater impacts for Baja California but we the whole time we didn't know exactly where some of those greater impacts were going to end up surfacing so once we start to see some impacts being less important trying to communicate the new focus of hazards to people so that they don't still feel like um, we're telling them anything could happen and then they only see some rain or something like that. So um, to keep that um, warning warning fatigue a little lower um, because we do want people in the public to listen when we say something, but um, that it's always a concern that then they won't take the next thing more seriously. Um, like for example, this atmospheric river, we we want to convey that this is really significant, but then we do get a lot of um, people kind of having that impression that, oh, well, since Hillary wasn't too bad, this is not going to be bad. So um, trying to, yeah, narrow in on what, what the new impacts are as we, as the system keeps evolving. Yeah, and I'll circle back to, to the noise that I brought up at the very beginning, um, you know, and also it's kind of touches on what Rose is saying here is we often struggle with these systems and it's not just Henri and Hillary, but if a system is a strong hurricane four or five days away, people think and see that hurricane as being the same entity when it reaches 
their locality. We call it a hurricane. It, we, people have a mental image of what a big bad hurricane does. And then when it's weakening, even if we're expecting it to weaken as it approaches the coast and the hazards like rainfall become you know, the bigger, biggest concern, that's not what people have in their mental image of what the storm may do. And so it's how do you get through the noise of what it's called? It's, it's a hurricane now, Cat 3, but it's expected to weaken. How do you get people to focus on the watches and warnings that are actually in effect where they live, regardless of what the storm's doing right now, and to understand all the different hazards that that storm may pose, rainfall, storm surge, wind, tornadoes, uh, even rip currents. I mean, we see so many deaths along the coast from rip currents, from storms that aren't even gonna make landfall. So I don't have an answer here. I just know as the Hurricane Center, we're really trying to be hyper-focused on each of the individual hazards of a storm, what the risks are of those hazards to individual localities, states, and trying to de-emphasize, for example, what's the category of the storm? Because in the end, that may not be so important for the story. Thanks so much. Uh, so at this time, we'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, I don't know, John Ben, do we have anything worth jumping in yet or should we keep it in the room? And we can take some questions from the room first and then we'll move on to virtual. Okay, uh, yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Sarah McBride from the USGS. I'm just curious um, for the panel, uh, how useful scenarios like Arc Storm have been in terms of communicating uh, this massive event currently in California, if that's been helpful or if that's been difficult to explain the difference between the arc storm scenario and what is currently happening. Uh, to my understanding, that arc storm term is this, um, I don't, I'm not sure how new that is, but it definitely took off recently for us in terms of describing um, California's big disaster being some really significant storm that will cause massive flooding um, and, and shut down the state for a long time. Uh, in comparison, like Pacific Northwest thinks about like Cascadia. So that's kind of like California's major version of that. Um, we've generally found it a bit distracting because uh, that um, is something that people want to um, try and catch, um, catch, clicks and, and attention because of how scary and um, cool sounding that name is um, when when we're trying to hone in like on a, on our specific area and then say like these three counties are at the greatest risk. So it, it can be distracting, but um, in another sense, it may be having that con concept of the worst case scenario is helpful for emergency preparedness or for emergency management to have that idea of what the what the um, the big one could be. So it was kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, I'll agree with Rose. I think there's a big difference between the public communication aspects, where I think it's probably more of a hindrance to have people throwing around worst case scenarios and saying, well, this is the one, you know. Um, but I think for stress testing, uh, emergency response uh, and preparedness, I think that worst case scenarios, uh, imagining what it could be is really useful. I think that's actually one of the ways we talk about in the weather service, we talk about impact-based decision support services. And a lot of the focus is on real-time support. But of course, there's a whole EM cycle, right? And there's other aspects of that that are super important. So um, having that real deep connection uh, and blue sky days and saying, you know, well, in this particular community, here's about how bad we think the rain could get. You may not have actually experienced that yet. Are you actually ready for that? What would you do? Um, one example, we did an exercise. We WPC, we partnered with the uh, local office in New York City. And we there was an event in 2014 on Long Island where they had like 14 inches of rain or something. And the hourly rates were like five inches per hour. So that was worse than it was in Ida in New York City proper. We're like, if you move that over 30 or 40 miles, it would have been right in New York City. And it, the results would have been really, really bad. And what would you do in that scenario? So that's an example of, I think, how you can have that deep connection with partners and stress test the system in a theoretical way and hopefully help them be a little more prepared. Yeah, and I'll say there, you know, we're already thinking ahead. Um, for example, if you look back at Hurricane Otis last year, hit Acapulco, uh, the devastation that occurred there, we haven't seen a Hurricane Cat 5 strength hit a major metro area in the United States. 
uh, in a long time. Andrew did in the Miami area, but Andrew was also small. Um, it, it could have been much worse uh, if it had been a bigger system. So we're already starting those conversations with emergency managers this off season to start thinking about what would you do if you were in charge of a major metro area and you had this type of storm threatening your area. Um, so I don't think we'll have the answers, uh, but you know we, we want EMs and other folks to be as prepared as possible uh, because there is always going to be uncertainty in these events. We're never going to know for sure if it is going to be the worst case scenario, but oftentimes you have to prepare for that possibility. There's so many questions here. I'm sure there's a lot to go through here. Um, I, Alex, you brought up the pavement and pipes problem and that you're developing this um, urban rain rate dashboard. Will that apply everywhere? And I'm just thinking about how little we know about some of the pipes in some cities. In Atlanta, there were a lot of big sewage pipes. They didn't really know where they were or how big they were. Um, and I think it's similar in some other cities. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think the initial, so the practical matter, I think it, initially it'll be, you know, several dozen cities and then it may scale up from there. Um, and yeah, in terms of the practical impact of, you know, do cities fully understand the pipes in their city? I, I mean, it probably varies. And I, I think modeling that in a hydrologic sense is, is a challenge. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we have colleagues at the National Water Center, new ne the newest national center in the National Weather Service. They're working on hydrologic modeling that I think that's a tough nut to crack, but I think they're going to work on that to try to mod like, can we get the modeling right in urban areas? For us, we're trying to communicate the meteorology of the situation. And, and generally speaking, they have an idea of what sort of rain rate will cause problems in that city, just based on past experience course, if you're off the scale, um, you, you may not know, but, um, usually they'll know like an inch per hour or two inches per hour, what that will cause. Um, Karen Florini, with, Karen Florini with climate central. I'm wondering if, if you have anything you'd particularly like to mention in terms of the rapid intensification storms where, you know, all of a sudden thing that was barely a tropical depression is now a category whatever and and how that affects warnings yeah excellent question uh so i, I think the research is showing that rapid intensification events are occurring more frequently um we have not cracked the nut however we we are a little bit encouraged in that some of the statistics we've been compiling on our forecasts seem to should suggest that we are actually getting better at forecasting these events. Uh, again, not perfect by any means. I mean, we totally missed o Otis. Um, you know, it went from a tropical depression, tropical storm up to a major hurricane in the span of, of a day or two. So uh, we still have events that we're not capturing, but with a lot of the investments that have been made in the National Weather Service and NOAA on, uh, on intensity forecasting, essentially, we have seen the models providing more skillful guidance to the forecasters. And so we've seen a shift where we're, we're capturing these events more frequently. I think that's a positive. Um, but you know, talking about the Otis example in the US, how do we get folks to realize that even if the forecasts are getting better, they're never gonna be perfect. And we still have to prepare for these events, especially if they're gonna become more frequent, being prepared for these events before they happen. So uh, excellent question, and it's definitely on our radar you know, as we speak. We have several questions from our uh, virtual attendees. Um, these are directed to the entire panel. Does strategic risk communication, such as best practices, look different on other continents? And uh, do we learn from one another? I, I can start there for the tropical cyclone realm. Um, so one of our duties at the Hurricane Center is to coordinate very closely with the, with the countries in Central America and the Caribbean uh, for, for storms that are threatening that the region. We're not responsible for putting out hurricane watches and warnings for those countries. Uh, they are ultimately responsible, but we coordinate with them every forecast cycle uh, to determine, actually make our recommendation, then they determine whether or not to put those watches and warnings out. And to my knowledge, our region is the only region across the world where that occurs. There are other national hurricane centers in other parts of the world. There's one in Japan, Australia, Fiji, uh, and so forth, India, uh, but they don't have the framework that we have in our part of the world where they're coordinating with other countries 
around them quite as closely as we are. And so um, not that there are places where we can get better, but I think uh, what, what we do in our part of the world uh, really it shows the strength of the partnerships we have with our region. Um, and I think that could um, you know, be something that the other regions uh, should probably be focusing on and, and strengthening as well in order to get those risk messages out to other countries uh, that aren't actually making the forecast themselves. Next question from the virtual at attendees. Uh, again, anybody at the panel? Do the strategies change as the lead time changes from a small signal at two weeks to specific actions at two days, for example? Absolutely. Um, with our with our weather on the West Coast coming off of um, the oceans a lot of times, there's a lot of uncertainty several days out. Um, two weeks out, you could get models saying anything. Um, so with this atmospheric river here, um, we, we saw the signal pretty far out for something like this, um, much further out than um, usual. So we, we did start talking about it ahead of time. We talked about it having a potential to be more significant than the storm we were currently dealing with when we started messaging this. We, we were putting it at like 30% chance. We, we tried to compare it to previous, um, previous storms, things like that, um, and, and put that chance further out, put that, um, that potential, but we, we don't hone into, um, the specific details and, um, action items as much until we get to that, that closer few days out. But we definitely try and message that there is that chance, especially to our partners, um, a little bit less so, um, to, uh, the public in terms of messaging several weeks out, because then that, that could start that warning fatigue, um, of there's always a storm every two weeks out. You got to always be prepared. Um, and we do want to let our public like have a breather and, and, and relax too in between things. Um, but for our partners who don't have nearly that issue, we we're, we're happy to tell them like, there's like a 30% chance right now. There's 15% chance right now, um, even in the week and then some time period. Yeah, I think I'll just add, I think the conversations you have with your partners it does definitely change, like Rose said, like um, at different lead times, uh, you can have that. And then I think there's also value in, you know, like our national center outlooks of having a consistent methodology across lead times and, and a probabilistic framework. So, you know, like even if it's five days out, if the probabilities are really high, well, that's meaningful, right? Um, because you don't usually see that. And theoretically, a probabilistic outlook should be able to account for those uncertainties um, if it's well calibrated uh, that far in advance. The other thing I think, you know, when you're considering lead times is you occasionally run into these issues with the rhythms of daily life, right? You It may be a Friday, right? And you're like, well, people are about to go check out for the weekend. So this may not be the ideal lead time with which to put out this message, but we, we are getting concerned about it. Maybe we need to try to reach as many people as we can now. Um, before people go into the weekend. So understanding those things, and Robbie mentioned something earlier about sending out wheel alerts at 2 a.m., um, that may not be ideal either. Well, we're unfortunately out of time. Um, this has been a great discussion. I really appreciate all of your time and willingness to talk about this. This has been really great to start things off. So um, I guess we can thank our panel and... Um, And we'll have our next panel come up and we'll turn it over to Ann Bostrom. Everybody, um, we're going to move right on to our next panel. So if you could take your seats, we're going to move forward right now. Um, after the next panel, we will be coming back together for lunch.
Okay, on to the next perspective on communicating risks of tropical cyclones. Again, I'm Ann Bostrom. It is my great pleasure to welcome. Are we ready? Is everybody ready? It's my great pleasure to welcome our panelists for a researcher's perspective on communicating risks of atypical tropical cyclones. We have three speakers in this session who will take a more theoretical and, and uh, research perspective on this topic. First, we have Roxanne Cohen-Silver from University of California, Irvine. Welcome, Roxanne. We have Julie DeMuth from the National Science Foundation National Center for Atmospheric Research. Welcome, Julie. And we have online, Hi, Emma. We have Emma Spiro from the University of Washington. So a really excellent group of researchers here. And Roxanne is going to kick us off. Thank you. There, you may do whichever you like. Yeah. We're just getting those set up now. Are you? Oops. I think they're yeah. wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today on research perspectives on communicating risks of tropical cyclones. About six years ago, my colleagues and I published an article in Risk Analysis in which we conducted a literature review, a systematic review of decades of research on how people uh, evacuate from natural disasters, whether or not they do, and the characteristics of this uh, body of research. We concluded that there were many conflicting results, largely because of the limitations of the, me the methodological limitations of the research in this area. Many times people were asked retrospectively, sometimes days, weeks, months, or even years after a storm to tell the researcher a little bit about what their decision-making process was and how they were, what their behaviors were. And we concluded that this research really needed to take a different course. We indicated that ideal research on the topic of evacuation should be prospective, trying to identify at-risk samples before the event occurred, before the disaster occurred. Ideal research should be longitudinal with immediate as well as repeated post-event assessments. Ideal research should use representative samples of the population under study, and ideal research should be comprehensive. We concluded that small cross-sectional studies with non-representative samples are basically inefficient and can provide little new information after decades of research that's been conducted thus far. With the generous support of the National Science Foundation, my colleagues and I conducted a study that was designed to address the limitations that we identified in our risk analysis paper. We conducted a study of Hurricane Irma in Florida, in which we collected data as the hurricane was barreling toward Florida, about 60 hours prior to the when it hit made landfall in Florida. We had a representative sample across the state. About 90% of the participants completed the survey within the first 48 hours. We had about 1,600. About a month later, we can followed up. We retained about 90% of our sample, collected about one month after the um, hurricane hit Florida. We had about 1,500 people. You can see from this map that we covered across Florida by wave two. We were still covering uh, the vast um, majority of the state. And again, these were this was a representative sample. Um, 
this kind of an, a design enabled us to investigate psychological responses before and after the hurricane. We published a paper in 2019 in JAMA Network Open looking at the psychological impact of the hurricane. But what I would like to talk to you about in the remaining minutes that I have here is how we came to study people's perceptions of evacuation zones. So right before the hurricane was hitting, I took this picture of my computer screen. It was on CNN.com in an evacuation zone, leave now. Of course, that presupposes that people know whether or not they are in an evacuation zone. And this was also shown on the news right around the same time. As you see, the entire state of Florida is being enveloped in a bright red message. And this is, for me, very easy to understand why it might be difficult for people to know whether or not they are actually in an evacuation zone. So we collected data both before and after the hurricane. I'm just going to whip through this to make one message. Um, before the hurricane, people said they were not in an evacuation zone. Many of them evacuated anyway. Before the hurricane, people said that they would evacuate, but they did not evacuate uh, when reported one month later. In fact, some people said that they were in the zone, but they wouldn't evacuate, but more than half of them actually did evacuate when we uh, assess them a month later. Under threat, people's perceptions of their evacuation zone status may not be accurate. And we had the latitude longitude of every participant in our study and were able to map on whether or not they were in an evacuation zone as the hurricane was approaching. And just in uh, very quickly, the yellow bar are individuals who were inaccurate in their perceptions based on their G GIS mapping onto evacuation zones. Uh, people were both inaccurate in terms of whether they said they were in a zone, if they were not in a zone, uh, whether they decided to evacuate or not. About 40% of our sample incorrectly reported their evacuation zone status. About 6% indicated that they were unaware of the evacuation orders and uh, almost 17%, over 17% of our sample evacuated unnecessarily. What predicts whether or not people evacuated? Well, not surprisingly, and this came up in the prior session, whether or not people had previously evacuated for a prior storm was a strong predictor of whether or not they actually evacuated from this storm, independent of whether or not they were in an evacuation zone. And also, before the hurricane, people told us how likely they were to be impacted by the hurricane. Those pre-hurricane risk perceptions were also a strong predictor of whether or not they evacuated. But what predicts the pre-hurricane risk perceptions? Actually, it, the strongest predictor was media exposure before the hurricane. And this was also something that just came up in the prior panel. I think it's really important because of the two slides that I showed you in the evacuation. If you're in an evacuation zone, please leave. And then to show a, a, a cone across the entire state. I think it's really important that we and the research and weather community start thinking about what we can do going forward as we are thinking about making changes in both communicating as well as researching. The one message is that retrospective reports of pre-hurricane perceptions may not reflect reality. Under threat, perceptions of risk appear to shift over time. Perceptions of evacuation zone status also appear to shift over time. And perceptions of zone status may not reflect reality. Finally, I think partnering with the media is critical. And I, again, was very um, gratified to hear in the prior panel the discussion about working with the media in advance of the storm. 
Shifting risk rarely results in shifting evacuation messages, and perhaps that may be revisited, or importantly, I think, debriefing after storms, both with the media as well as with the general public, is critical for ensuring a population's understanding of and preparation for the next storm. I'd like to thank the generous support of the National Science Foundation, as well as my collaborators and facilitators. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Julie. Okay, is there a... Oh, that's going the wrong way. There we go. Okay. Um, so Roxy and I are going to compliment each other really beautifully with our set of slides here. Um, I'm just going to get a little bit more granular with what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so just to begin, thank you for the invitation here. I'm Julie DeMuth. Um, I'm a research scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And I want to dive right in, but I want to thank my many wonderful collaborators on this effort, the research team that is listed here, um, and we have generous support from NOAA and many wonderful NOAA collaborators that are listed down there at the bottom. So like I said, this is gonna complement what Roxy talked about really beautifully, but just on a more granular scale. This is the research question that really is the foundation for the work that we wanna investigate. Looking at a given hurricane event, so not across events like Roxy was doing, but for a given hurricane event, how, do the risk information, uh, how does the risk information that people use, their risk perceptions, and their protective actions that they, take in, that they take, how do those evolve as the real world hurricane itself is evolving and as the risks that it is posing or the hazards, which Robbie talks so nicely about, as those are evolving as well? This seems like it's a straightforward question to investigate, but in reality, it's quite tricky. Um, we did do a prospective longitudinal panel design where we surveyed the same people repeatedly during a given event as it was threatening and approaching landfall. We got three waves in during the predictive phase when the hurricane was threatening and approaching landfall. Each of those waves was in the field for about 24 hours, so really short turnaround with about a 24 hour interval in between. And we did that three times as the hurricane was threatening. Then we also did a post-storm survey so that we could see what people's actual experiences were compared to what they thought was going to happen. And you can see some more details there. I would be more than happy to talk about the methods in great detail if people are interested. We did this for Henri, but before that, we actually did this initially in 2020 for Hurricanes Laura and Marco, um, which were threatening the Gulf Coast around the same time. And then we also did this uh, a year and a half ago now for Hurricane Ian. And this is just an image of where we fielded for each of those storms, anywhere from 50 to 100 miles inland. Um, and the, the black areas are the zip codes of the respondents who completed the, the surveys for each of these events. We did get in three predictive waves. And you can see we had a pretty good sample of anywhere from 800 to over 1,000 people who were responding to all of the waves for a given hurricane. So even though we did this for three different events, we didn't survey the same people for all the different events, of course. So really focusing on how people are responding within a given event. And just a few more details. Um, we've talked a lot about Henri. Of course, it made landfall as a tropical storm, but these different events had different characteristics. So um, Marco never actually made landfall, uh, actually kind of went near the mainland US uh, as a weak tropical storm. But then we had Laura and Ian, which both rapidly intensified to category four hurricanes. So it's interesting to look at how people are responding across these different storms, which again, have very different characteristics. But just digging into uh, Henri a little bit more because this will become important. This shows what the cones, and I know we shouldn't just focus on the cones, but just showing what the cones are looking like at each of the waves when we fielded. And one thing I really want to draw your attention to is when we fielded that first wave, wave one, you could see the cone was actually um, kind of showing that parts of New England were threatened. But halfway through wave one, the cone shifted a little bit west. Those hurricane and tropical watches went into effect. And at that point in time, Henri was forecast to make landfall as a hurricane. And then you can see kind of what happened at wave two and wave three. But that shift within that first wave will become really important with some of the results I'm going to show. One more quick methodological detail here is because the areas that are at risk are shifting over time, we decided we wanted to categorize people as 
um, exposed to the hurricane risks or not. And we did this for each of those um, events and for each wave based on whether people were in the cone, if they were in watches and mornings, um, if they were in areas where tropical storm force wind speed probabilities were greater than 30% or if they were in an evacuation order. And so what I'm gonna show are results just of the people who are in these exposed areas so that we can compare these across the different uh, events. And so just to dive in, actually one more quick detail because we were talking so much, Roxy mentioned this too, about um, different characteristics, including people's past experiences. I don't have time to dig into the details here, but the Henri residents who were exposed have lived there longer, about 10 years longer on average, but they have fewer past hurricane experiences than the people who responded for Laura Marco and for Ian. Okay, so just a few details here. Um, so for all of these uh, different slides, I'm gonna show um, different kind of plots that are the different questions, the different dependent variables we wanna look at. We're gonna show the, on the X axis are the waves. So we're showing the means over time at each of those waves. And on the Y axis here in particular, we're talking about the number of times per day that people are getting information um, from different sources. In orange is Henri, blue is uh, Laura and Marco, and then uh, black is Ian. So just a few things you'll see from these results here. If you look at Henri, you kind of see the increase um, in terms of how frequently people are getting information from wave one to wave two, again, potentially because that cone is shifting and those watches went into effect. And you see this across the different sources that, we, that we're looking at here. But for the most part, that's the main difference you see in the responses for Henri compared to uh, Laura, Marco, and Ian. People are getting information about as frequently across these different events from all these different sources. The one difference we see here is for the National Hurricane Center, where if you look at that orange line, on average, over all the different waves, people on Henri are getting information less frequently from them compared to uh, Laura, Marco, and Ian. The other thing we measured was environmental cues. We know that this is really important to people. And so interestingly, by wave three for Henri, people are looking outside more than they, than they um, are in the other hurricanes that we uh, collected data for. So that's one uh, set of results. Let me see if I can get this to move forward. We also wanted to look at how important different types of information were. Um, and so this is a similar set of results here uh, as what I showed before. But here now we're looking at how important people think the cone is or the track or different wind speeds and so forth. And again, if you look at that orange line, you see kind of that bump from wave one to wave two for Henri. So people think that the information is more important from wave one to wave two. Um, and we see that for the most part, they think that the cone is really important, the track and the wind speeds. This is really where we see the biggest increase from wave one to wave two. But other than that, again, not a lot of difference across the different storms, right? Went on to measure risk perceptions, which we measured in a lot of different ways. But one of the ways we measured this was by asking people, how likely do you think it is that the area where you live will be affected by the different hazards? This touches nicely on what Robbie talked about, trying to communicate these different hazards. Again, you see that big bump for Henri from wave one to wave two across all of these different types of hazards, but highest um, in terms of people think they're most likely to be affected by those strong winds. Less so by rainfall flooding, less so by surge flooding. For Henri, overall, people thought it was less likely that they would be affected by tornadoes, which ultimately I think played out. We also wanted to see people's perceptions um, of how likely they thought they would experience different negative impacts or their perceived susceptibility. Again, you see this theme comes up over and over again, this bump from wave one to wave two. Um, and people thought overall that they were most likely to experience power outages and road closures. This was true across all of the storms, maybe damage to structures. And in Henri, people were less likely to think that they would experience emotional impacts or financial losses compared to the other storms. And then just one more quick set of results. I know I'm going through this really quickly. We also wanted to see what protective actions people were taking at those different waves across the different storms. And so here now focus on that orange bar, that's Henri, and really look at the areas where that orange bar is, is shorter than the, the blue or the black bar, which are Laura, Marco, and, and Ian. And you can see that overall Henri residents um, are getting about the, the number of people who are following the forecast information, moving things, or doing other home preparation are about the same as for the other storms, where you really see a lower percentage of people doing this in Henri is for people who are getting supplies, gassing up their vehicles, boarding up, or evacuating. But otherwise, we're seeing really similar kind of protective actions for some of those different behaviors. So just to kind of summarize, I know I went through this quickly. Yes, Henri was atypical in a lot of ways, but the respondents, maybe not so much. There's a lot of similarity across the different storms. There are a few things that are different there that I just highlighted. But just to kind of um, underscore this broader implication, and again, I think this follows nicely on Roxy's talk, this kind of longitudinal perishable data that we're collecting during a hurricane event as it's actually threatening is really essential to understand the dynamic processes that people are going through. And that if we really wanna assess how well the risk communication is working and identify where we need improvements, 
we have to be able to collect this kind of information across different hurricane events. And this is uh, sort of a screen capture of a recommendation that we uh, put into a report, and I'll go to this final slide here, um, where we made recommendations as we piloted this methodology for how NOAA and the broader weather community can expand on, on this kind of data that we've collected here. So with that, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Julie. And now we'll turn it over to Emma. Good morning, all. I'm going to ask to share slides from here. So I'm going to see if I can get that to work. Does that look like it is working? Yes, looks good. Perfect. Okay. And I apologize if my video is flickering. It seems to be going um, in and out a little bit. But it's lovely to be here all with you all virtually. Apologies, I couldn't be there in person. Um, so my name is Emma Spiro. I am an associate professor at the University of Washington Information School um, and one of the co-founders and incoming faculty director for the Center for an Informed Public here at the University of Washington. Um, so this talk, I think, is also going to pair really nicely. Instead of talking about sort of surveys and survey data, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, online social media data. So let's see here. Um, so since networked social media sort of hit the scene, um, especially in crisis communications, sort of in early 2000s, our team has been studying how and why they're used during crisis events. So this could be natural hazards as our focus is today, but it also includes things like civil or political unrest, domestic terrorism, um, and breaking news events like elections. So, you know, this is this is our sort of bread and butter, all that noise that Robbie was mentioning in one of the earlier panels. Um, our work is really grounded in the social sciences, so aiming to understand sort of how information flows in these kind of systems and what people do with it. Um, and we know a lot about how this works during crisis events. We know people come together. We know they come together to try to make sense of what is going on around them. Um, and they need to make these kind of critical decisions about what to do and when, as we have heard um, from our other speakers. So they need information to do this. Um, and we know it's also very common in these kind of situations for rumors to emerge. Um, and these kind of rumors have been studied for um, many years in the social sciences. Oops, there we go. Um, and a rumor is a sort of term that I would sort of define as information unverified at the time it's being talked about. Um, and this sort of concept conceptually has been the focus of our work over the past decade here at the University of Washington um, and previously at the University of California, Irvine, um, where I was as a graduate student. Um, so uh, rumors um, uh, are, can be really useful in situations. They allow people to come together together, alleviate their anxiety, and take protective actions. Um, and we know that people use online systems to access information. We know that these vast amounts of social and behavioral data are work and are available to researchers. And so we can learn a lot about how people engage with information during crisis events. Um, but the challenge here is that we also can see where things go wrong, um, where this collective sense-making process that I talked about before could be strategically manipulated um, and result in mis- and disinformation. So our team at the University of Washington collects millions and millions of social media messages across a handful of different social media platforms. And then we're able to compare things like how information flows, um, and how people engage with information across hazards. We look at message content, at format, about how things are designed in social media spaces to understand why some things spread and others do not. Um, so, you know, things that are about hazards and their impact are sort of highly spreadable and can go viral online. Things that are sort of more about um, uh, thank yous or directed at particular uh, entities or accounts online are much less likely to spread um, far and wide. So um, I think one of the really interesting things in this space is that over the years, we've kind of developed a much better sense of what I might call the sort of rules that govern information flow in these systems. Um, and, you know, from uncertainty and trust 
um, to social networks, to emotional valence, to the actual words that are present in these messages, to the larger narratives that are um, sort of part of people's worldview uh, in different communities that are affected by disasters. And so we know a lot about the features of different information narratives of rumors that contribute to their virality in online systems. Um, and I think it's really important to uh, recognize in these systems also that people engage and they spread information because they want to help each other, right? There's a sort of well-meaning, I'm going to pass on this emergency evacuation notice because if I don't, someone could lose their life. Um, so especially in crisis situations, it is really important to remember that people share information because they're trying to help. Um, now, lately, despite all that we know, um, these information environments are becoming more and more challenging, um, more challenging for researchers, which I will talk a little bit about at the end, more challenging for emergency managers and crisis responders, and more challenging for the public. Um, and that is because um, they become rife with mis and disinformation, false and misleading messages, um, and bad faith actors that are trying to manipulate the information environments that we all live in. Um, and we're all vulnerable, right? This is is something, you know, you talk to researchers of mis and disinformation, and they've all had an experience where they have shared message uh, information that turns out to be questionable or perhaps not framed in the right way. Um, and this is a really key aspect because not only are we all vulnerable, but we all have to participate in order for information to spread online. This is a very participatory kind of phenomena. Um, and of course, these two things in combination makes it very challenging. Um, these problems are only growing in complexity with the introduction of generative AI tools, so artificial intelligence tools, which can very easily create images like this of the uh, so, you know, claimed Pentagon bombing. Um, we have challenges around not only the increased quantity and quality of information, right, and a very low bar barrier to doing that, but also increased personalization of information, persuasion of information, um, and other kind of open pathways for these tools to involuntarily generate false or misleading information due to what are called hallucinations in the system. Um, I do want to point out that this is not necessarily a new problem, right? just because we have, for example, weather images that be can be created by um, artificial intelligence based tools, you know, that this has been a problem in sort of the crisis space for many years. So you are all probably familiar with this image, every, you know, tropical storm hurricane that we have, we see a shark swimming down, you know, a national highway. Um, but these tools also um, offer interesting opportunities, especially in the research and sort of prediction domain for how they can be used to improve our response to crisis events. So from AI tools being used to prediction to various kinds of interventions that are being designed in the research community to help support the collective sense-making problem um, process to help people make decisions during these very uncertain situations. Um, I do want to leave plenty of time for us to discuss, so let me uh, wrap up a bit um, with a few of the sort of challenges I see, especially coming from a research perspective over the next few years. You know, we've made lots of progress over the past decade plus, um, but we're really at a challenging sort of inflection point at the moment where uh, social media platforms in particular are rolling back previous access options for researchers, that, that really has affected our ability to collect, curate, archive, and share data. Um, all of those things have been significantly restricted um, in the past year plus. Um, we also see that the online environment, the social media space is becoming increasingly fragmented. Um, so there are many, many platforms and users sort of move across and within in them, they move information and they have different presence on these different platforms. This makes it really difficult for researchers to observe. It also makes it challenging for users to navigate and find the information that they need and for officials to know where and when to share information in these spaces. Um, we also see a lot of what I would call multimodal information, so text 
plus audio and video um, is becoming much more widely used. You know, the rates of YouTube and TikTok and these newer video based platforms, especially in younger populations, is significant and rising. Um, and there are many new research challenges there. Um, and then, you know, maybe perhaps most importantly, we're operating in a world now where we see trust in information and trust in institutions is at risk. Um, and this last element, I think, is really critical to address because, um, in fact, many of the sort of uh, phenomena we study here at the University of Washington, the goal of these activities is to really undermine trust in information and in institutions and in each other. And so, and this is a really critical element um, and uh, I hope we will able to discuss how this and some of the other things fit in with what we've seen so far this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna kick off. I'm gonna kick off with a question and then welcome your questions. So please put questions in Slido if you have them or um, raise your hand. And so I'll start with uh, the first question, which is that um, we'd like to identify how the experiences of the managers and forecasters that we heard about in the first panel connect with your research agendas and what you have shared today. So we, can you draw that connection for us? And maybe we should start with Julie, Roxanne. Um, I mean, I think kind of an obvious connection so Anne and I were talking about this prior to um, us kicking off this morning. I mean, I was saying, Anne, you know, are we are we all in agreement on what we mean by the term risk communication when we're coming into this workshop? Because I think so much of what the way that we tend to think about risk communication isn't just, and I say that not to diminish it, but it's not just the messages that are going out to the public or to the emergency managers, but it's also understanding um, what are the tools that the forecasters have at their fingertips? One of the questions I wanted to ask um, in the previous panel, because Alex, you were also talking about the rain rates. I mean, that's a huge predictability problem. And to what degree does the research community actually um, have the capacity to help you understand what the rain rates are with sufficient skill at sufficient lead time so that um, those vulnerable populations can be managed by the different partners? And I think um, kind of this whole big broad connection in terms of everything that we're doing from the research space, whether it's, you know, from the atmospheric sciences or from the social sciences, through the forecasters who use all this information as a source of risk information for them to make decisions about the risk and generate new messages for their partners downstream and for members of the public is so important. And so I think everything we're doing is on a continuum. I mean, that's broader than the, just the results I showed, but I also think it's important just to set that big broad frame for this conversation. Yep. One thing that I think is really important is recognizing that although we are interdisciplinary, we can all benefit the public. And I think that it I have our work has been very much informed by individuals who are in emergency managers and uh, out people in the weather community to help us figure out what kinds of questions we should ask. But I, I want to give a specific example. I'm conducting research right now in Lake County, California, which is a community that is at very high risk of wildfires. And in fact, 60% of the community has burned since 2015. And in our meet, my uh, research team's meetings with the emergency management, they are convinced that everybody knows their evacuation zone. And so we collected data on a representative sample of almost 1,000 people. 60% of the sample at the very beginning of the 2023-24 wildfire season said that they did not know their zone, and the 40% who said that they did, uh, more than half were inaccurate. So I think that it is extremely important to understand that what um, weather, uh, re weather um, professionals emergency managers might think might be going on in the community could benefit from research. And we're sharing these data with our emergency management peers because I think that, that you know, they, they told me in advance that they were certain everybody knew their zone and they were pretty surprised. In the same way, I think we can go forward helping as researchers the weather and emergency manager communities in asking the kinds of questions that I think deserve to be asked. Thank you, Roxanne. Emma. 
Yes, uh, thank you. So I, I think maybe just I'll add a brief um, comment to what's already been said. But, you know, I think the other challenges uh, in this particular space is thinking about um, events that are unfolding in real time and how we as researchers, not only, you know, should we be working on the kind of longitudinal studies that Roxanne and Julie were describing, but also in real time, how can we lend our expertise to what we're seeing going on? And this is sort of more prominent in my own domain in the online space. So we work very closely with journalists, for example, to help translate what we're seeing online into uh, news articles and media articles and that can come out. And so strengthen these kind of partnerships, I think is, is really great, but it's really challenging to um, think about how research might have to operate in a very sort of rapidly changing environment as these events are going on. Excellent. Well, we have time for one or two questions in the room. Uh, Richard, I think you raised your hand first. Thank you. I really wanted to react to some of the comments that Roxanne was making. My name is sorry, Richard Allen. I'm a seismologist, first of all, um, from UC Berkeley. Um, I just I was really shocked, Roxanne, by some of the stuff you presented that people don't know whether they're in an evacuation zone and it's very difficult for them to get that kind of information. Um, from my perspective, there's no reason why anybody with a smartphone can't get the direct information. You're in an evacuation zone. You need to do this, that and the other. Um, in the case of earthquake early warning, that's exactly what we do, right? We have to draw a, a boundary around the region that's going to ex experience strong shaking or weak shaking. And then we can tell people, you know, very short, simple messages what to do. So I guess my question is, why why don't we have this? It's sort of maybe it's a question for not just for you, but for the broader audience. Why don't we give very directed messages to specific locations telling people when they're in an evacuation zone? I'll, I'll just say, I, I think that that's a really important question. And just in, in Lake County, our emergency managers say that they have told people what their evacuation zones are. But the evacuation zone is a very complicated um, set of numbers and letters. Maybe that's just not, you know, maybe we need to look at what Disney does in their, um, you know, in their parking lot and, you know, you you know a particular uh, Disney character, and that's what you remember. But it, it, you know, it, I think that we have to think about how individuals process this information and retain it. And you know, is it a, is it a um, something that is a magnet on their refrigerator? I, I'm not sure. There was somebody over in the. But can I just say the whole point of delivering it to a personal cell phone is they don't need to know their evacuation zone. They only get it on the cell phone if they are in the evacuation zone. We will come back to this, Richard, for sure. Um, there was one more question here, and then we need to turn to one or two questions on Slido. Yes. Oh, um, were you pointing to me or? So, uh, sorry, my name is Christina Finch from FEMA, and I was actually going to build on that just a little bit. Um, in that, evacuation zones are not standardized, so they are different letters, colors. They're also defined by different geographic boundaries, whether that be roadways, zip codes, other relatable items. And part of that difference is because they're developed at state and local levels. So there isn't a national standard for evacuation zones. There's also not a consistently available resource to find all evacuation zones. It varies based on your state and your jurisdiction. So my question for the researchers was going to be, and I realize we may not have time, but is have you looked at when you're doing these studies uh, how those zones are defined and whether or not that influences if understanding, if you know your zone is effective and the availability of those evacuation zone information. So whether that's available on your county website as a map, a static map or an interactive map or looking at if it's available on your phone or a know your zone application would be interesting questions. I'll just say that um, there was a website during Hurricane Irma that you could put your address in to find out whether you were not you were in the zone or not. And I could not figure it out. So it, you know, sometimes it would say B or C and you couldn't really tell for sure. So I think, you know, that that's this is beyond the scope of the kind of research that I do, but I think it is certainly an extremely important point about I, I think my research just says people don't necessarily know their zone. 
And then I think it's, uh, you know, a great deal of information could dive into the specifics of it. Maybe that's the kind of thing Julie does. Well, I think, no, I was going to, well, we do measure also people's perceived uh, perceptions of whether they're in an evacuation zone. We've done this for hurricanes and for flooding and for flash flooding. And, and we do similarly find, I couldn't tell you the numbers off the top of my, my head that people are wrong with their perceptions, a good chunk of people are, but I think maybe this is a little provocative. I think the evacuation zones are important, but I also want to go back to the previous panel who talked a lot about how we do need to be thinking about helping people understand the risk from all hazards, not just the ones that the evacuation zones are tied to, what it looks like for something like Hillary, where maybe there isn't an evacuation zone ahead of time for an, a type of event. Maybe there's fire evacuation zones, but not something similar for rainfall. And I think, and you know, Alex, tell me if I'm misrepresenting what you were saying, but when you were talking about some of the rainfall flooding in some of these urban areas, those aren't areas that traditionally would be an evacuation zone because those are typically defined based on surge, right? So I think I just want us to also broaden evacuation zone knowledge is really important, but how do we, again, ensure people are aware of all the hazards that might affect them in a changing climate? Alex talked about the tails and beautifully articulated how, how do we map those impacts for some of these extreme events or these atypical events when we might not have evacuation zones that you know, help us understand people's actual risk. And so thinking beyond the zone maybe in addition, I like that thinking beyond the zone. Let's take one. Should we take one question from online and then we'll break for lunch? Uh, thank you. Directed to the entire panel. So far, the research perspectives have highlighted limitations and how they have addressed those using longitudinal pre hazard data collection. What comes next? What types of work are needed next to continue improving risk communication? Emma, would you like to start since you? Um, yes, sure. Um, I think, uh, at least from my perspective, again, focused on some of the online and digital platforms, um, I, I think we need to be thinking about um, the best ways to across platforms, um, be able to share some of this information, recognizing that it not doesn't always have to come from official sources, but official sources are great seeds that then can be spread by the communities. Um, and, and so for me, I, I think the thing that we're excited, most excited about next um, is how can we study how information moves across platforms um, and gets changed in that process? Um, and then also how can we leverage some of these AI tools um, for good? So how can we support the collective sense-making process using these kind of new um, technologies. Emma, uh, Roxy? Yeah. Yes, I, I would like to point out that it is extremely difficult to get the kinds of pre-disaster um, pre studies that Julie and I talked about into the field. And I want to just comment that it requires funding. And I have to say, the National Science Foundation was extremely helpful in that regard. But with uh, my studies are extremely expensive. And without pre-disaster funding, uh, that it's really tough. And then also we have to concern ourselves with the Institutional Review Board. It requires very, very quick assessment and approval of our projects. So the kind of work that we're talking about has not been done by many people, not because others haven't had the same idea, but maybe they just weren't lucky enough to have a cooperative IRB or get the funding in time. And maybe I'll just underscore that and kind of characterize it in a complementary way. In, in atmospheric science, we observe the atmosphere all the time, right? We constantly have radars, we have satellites, we know what it's doing. We don't just study one or two hurricanes and say, we understand how all hurricanes work. So we need to be thinking about collecting this kind of social science observational data on an ongoing basis. And I just want to really bring in what Emma said too, um, and what Roxy also articulated is maybe continue to facilitate the mechanisms to transfer the knowledge that we're learning back to the operational community in real time. I love this or in near real time. So if we're collecting this data and we're learning something about people's misperceptions, can we then have that flow back to the National Weather Service, to our media partners, so that they might change their messaging accordingly, kind of operationalizing our risk communication. So, yeah. And on that operational note, we will break for lunch. And oh, um, please be back a minute or two before our, we start at 1245.